Association of Arab Students. And as you will know, this is the uh, second major event in the Palestine Week. Um, Palestine Week is one of the major activities of the Organization of Arab Students at Iowa State University. And the purpose of the week is to inform, try to inform the uh, American public, whether it be on campus or the Ames community in general, about the Palestinian problem from the Arab point of view. Uh, tonight, our speaker is Dr. Fawaz Turki, and it's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Turki was born in Haifa, Palestine, and he received his uh, graduate education in England and Australia, and he is a holder of a PhD in political science. In 1975, Dr. Turki was a uh, writer, visitor writer at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. In 1978, he was visiting professor at the State University of New York in Buffalo, where he taught several courses on um, um, communication in Palestinian nationalism culture and communication in Palestinian nationalism. Also, he is uh, the author of many books, uh, of which I will cite some examples. Uh, the Disinherited, uh, Poems from Exile, Tal Zatar was the, th the Hill of Time. And also, he wrote many articles in the uh, Christian Science Monitor, the New York Times, Journal of Palestine Studies, uh, International P uh, Perspectives, and many other uh, publications. Dr. Turki is well known for his articulate uh, uh, speeches and uh, courses on the uh, humanitarian side of the Palestinian problem. He also uh, tackled the existential component of the Palestinian people in many of his uh, publications. In addition, Dr. Turki is a well-known poet, and he has been invited to recite his poetry on many campuses in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure, but we might ask him to recite some of his poetry to us tonight, and uh, I'm sure he will oblige. Uh, I think uh, this is enough credibility for Dr. Turkey, and tonight he is going to talk to us about the Palestinians' historical imperatives and the myth of Camp David. Please welcome Dr. Turki. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I'm going to address myself, essentially, to the dynamic of conflict in the Middle East, placing the focus of my attention on the centrality of that conflict, which is the struggle for Palestine, and on the most recent manifestations of this conflict, namely the recently concluded treaty, notice I say treaty, not peace treaty, between Egypt and Israel. In essence, what we are going to be discussing would be the historical and political imperatives in that region and the mythology of Camp David as it relates to these historical imperatives. But you know, it's very difficult to talk in this country about the Palestinian people and the nature 
of their struggle for statehood and freedom. The reason for that is for a great many years now, the Palestinians have been victim to a whole body of mythology, a whole body of racist mythology that has alternately identified them as either terrorist cutthroats or as uh, refugees with a begging ball standing outside a tent in a refugee camp somewhere in the Arab world. Do you know this uh, body of mythology, this body of racist mythology, I say, has characterized not just the convention of statement, not just the psychic interaction between the West and the Palestinians, but indeed that of the West and all, virtually all, third world peoples. Indeed, I would suggest that all third world peoples have been victim of this body of mythology. I mean, we all know, for example, in the 40s, how uh, Mahatma Gandhi was dismissed by uh, Winston Churchill, you know, that counter-revolutionary cold warrior, dismissed uh, with the phrase, I quote, who is that mendicant ascending the stairs of the chancellor, unquote. Mahatma Gandhi, prophet of peace, dismissed with contempt as the mendicant ascending the stairs of the chancellor in India. Of course, we also know even in the 50s, as recently in history as the 50s, the British were still talking about how, quote, they couldn't grant independence to the Kenyans because the Kenyans were not ready for independence, unquote. As recent in history as the 50s. Indeed, in the 50s too, the French colonial overlords with the Mission Culturelle, Mission Civilisatrice, would talk about how the Tunisians, quote, could not govern themselves. So the French had to stay there. Heavens above. Even this country itself, less than a decade ago, was talking about the Vietnamese patriots in Vietnam struggling for freedom as peasants in black pajamas. Remember the peasants in black pajamas who were tools of the dirty communists in the north, threatening the freedom-loving regime of Diem and Thieu and Ki? And just last year, the New York Times and the LA Times and the Washington Post and the media in this country was talking about how the Iranian people were being led by Muslim reactionaries. I think that was the common phrase just about a year and a half ago. Muslim reactionaries were struggling, struggling against the um, modernization programs of the Shah of Iran, who was, of course, loved by his people, and so on and so forth. We needn't go into the racist interaction that characterizes um, other third world peoples who are victims of this mythology in this country. Suffice it to say that it's very difficult. Very often when I stand up in front of an audience in this country to talk about the Palestinians, I have to begin by saying, honest to God, I'm not a terrorist killer. I don't have uh, bombs in my pockets. Please share your humanity with me. I want to prove my humanity to you before I can even begin to talk about what the problem is all about. So the Palestinian problem is compounded further, not just because it is a third world problem, but because it is itself complex. I think we have to begin in our attempt to have a meaningful understanding of this problem and the historical imperatives in that region by appraising one crucial fact. And this is, we cannot approach what has come to be known as the Arab-Israeli dispute simplistically or naively, simply as a struggle between the Arabs and the Israelis, with the Arab world being identified as a politically or ideologically homogenous region struggling against another politically homogenous movement. The Arab world is imbued, is imbued with a great many ideological currents and political sensibilities. In fact, the Arab-Israeli dispute itself is a direct uh, outcome of the interplay of a great many of these ideological currents. It is the direct outcome 
and is shaped by the interplay of so many forces, sometimes forces that are dialectically opposed to each other, that exist in the Arab world. I would choose maybe four major forces that I would identify as four concentric circles of conflict that very often determine the dimension of what is known as the Middle Eastern conflict, that shape its development, and that has to be understood in order for us to have a creative understanding of what is happening. It is not just the Arab-Israeli dispute between Arabs and Israelis, far from. We have, first of all, um, the inner circle, one of these um, uh, concentric circles, that is the, the very nucleus, the very essence of this uh, conflict. We have, of course, a national struggle. We have a struggle between Palestinian nationalism and Zionism in Palestine. Palestinian nationalism being a struggle by the indigenous people of Palestine to gain freedom and independence in Palestine, a struggle that began 60 years ago, against the Zionist movement that sought to transplant to Palestine a people to establish or to superimpose the establishment in this country of another state. This is a national conflict. That we have another conflict or struggle, equally significant. We have a regional conflict. This is namely a conflict that began roughly around 30 years ago, a regional conflict uh, pitting the Arab regimes against Israel, or Israel against the Arab regimes. This is comparatively, of course, a peripheral conflict. That is to say, it has to do with uh, territorial dispute, diplomatic relations, trade relations, and so on. We have yet another conflict. We have an international dimension to the conflict, and this is the conflict or the struggle between the two superpowers, the USSR and the USA, to gain hegemony in the Arab world in order to protect their political, their massive political and economic interests in the region. And yet another one of these concentric circles or forces, and this is the, in, the inner uh, class conflict in the Arab world. That is the struggle between the left and the right, between the conservatives and the radicals between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots, between the vision of those who would like to see transformist change in the Arab world and those who would like to perpetuate the status quo or to perpetuate uh, a medieval or reactionary tradition in the Arab world. See, at all times, these four forces, and many more indeed, are constantly, interactively related to each other that determine what in fact is happening in the Middle East. Of course, we are not going to discuss these forces in detail because the emphasis in our discussion this evening is going to be on the Palestine conflict. Of course, in the minds of a great many of us today is the question of the Camp David Accords. What are the Camp David Accords all about? What are the possible consequences of the Camp David Accords and the treaty between Egypt and Israel? Are the Camp David Accords or the event of the Camp David Accords going to sharpen the contradictions in the Arab world as to bring about cataclysmic changes in the social, political uh, condition in the region? Or is this going to be the, the precursor, the treaty between Egypt and Israel, the precursor of more treaties between Israel and the other Arab states. Now, to have a meaningful appraisal of the Camp David Accords, we have to see it in context, in a creative context. That is to say, we have to see this treaty, the Camp David Accords, as the culmination of a great many events and political developments that have taken place in the Middle East over the last 10 years. Indeed, I would see it as a predictable, inevitable outcome of the interplay 
of so many forces and the development of so many political events in that region. Therefore, we have to see it in that context in order for us to understand what it is all about and then to glean or to glimpse an image of what its consequences might be. Now, unquestionably, over the last uh, 10 years, a great many events, a great many dramatic events have taken place in the region. I mean, the 1973 October War, the confrontation between the Palestinian guerrillas and King Hussein's forces in Jordan, the, what is known as the Black September events, the civil war in Lebanon, the passing of Palestinian exceptionalism is another event, dramatic event. Another dramatic event, perhaps, is the uh, emergence. For the first time in the Arab world, roughly around 1973-74, of leaders, Arab leaders, who were um, uh, publicly saying, we are now ready to recognize Israel, legitimize Zionism in Palestine, and conduct negotiations. I mean, this is an event that had not taken place in the Arab world for 60 years. This was a dramatic event that Arab leaders would be standing up and talking publicly, like Sadat and, and Assad and, and Khalid and so on, King Hussein, of course, would talk openly about the Resolution 242 as the basis for negotiations. We are willing to recognize Israel and so on and so forth if uh, the Palestinian component of the problem is addressed. I mean, let's keep in mind that um, as recently in history, in the history of this conflict, uh, as April 1965, when President Bourguiba stood up of Tunisia, stood up and he said, uh, let's recognize Israel if Israel were to go back to its 1947 borders. And this speech of Bourguiba was greeted with uh, denunciations and demonstrations all over the Arab world. So all these are dramatic events, but I submit to you that none of these events could be said to be the most dramatic. Indeed, I say to you that all these events are effect, not cause. I say to you that the most dramatic event to have taken place in the Middle East in many years, certainly over the last 10 years, has been the ability of the conservative Arab right to emerge into a position of ascendancy, power, and prestige in the Arab world for the first time since 1952. An, an ascendancy, an emergence that took place roughly uh, around the time after the 1973 war. When I speak of the conservative Arab right, I'm speaking of a physical, not abstract, reality. I'm speaking of the emergence of a power block in the Arab world that was politically on the right, politically conservative, and ideologically tuned in on a different wavelength from the power bloc that had been in the Arab world in a position of ascendancy since 1952. When I speak of this power bloc, I'm speaking essentially of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria, four very pivotal states, I should say very pivotal regimes in the Arab world that triggered by the events of 1973, the October War, were able to emerge as a power bloc and to begin to assert their political vision on the Arab world and to etch their reality on the situation in the whole Middle East. Now this was a formidable power bloc indeed, let's face it. Saudi Arabia had virtually all the capital in the Arab world. Jordan had the longest contiguous line with Israel, border with Israel. Egypt had uh, virtually all the pop uh, population in the Arab world. And Syria had virtually all, traditionally, had virtually all the mystique of Arab nationalism and, um, and the ethos of Arabism in its capital. So the emergence of this power block was, in fact, the cause for all these dramatic events that took place in the Middle East over the last 10 years and that culminated with the visit to Jerusalem by Sadat 
and the Camp David Accords. Now, one stumbling block remained for the supremacy of the conservative Arab right in the region, whose survival, by the way, was also underwritten by the American government. One stumbling block remained for the long grain of this power block in the region. And this was the coexistence in the same region of a movement that was dialectically opposed to it, ideologically and politically, and on every, on every other level, namely the Palestinian movement. You see, the conservative Arab right politically was committed to committed to uh, peace with Israel or a settlement with Israel a la 242. Recognition, partial rights for the Palestinians, and ideologically, the conservative Arab right was committed to um, stability in the region, quote unquote, stability in the region, that in itself would create conditions for the perpetual supremacy of its uh, ascendancy, its power in the region. Palestinian movement represented a major threat for the supremacy of the conservative Arab right. In fact, it became a precondition for the survival of the conservative Arab right and for the implementation of its uh, policies to destroy the Palestinian movement. And indeed, Lebanon, 1975-76, became a theater for, the con uh, for this destruction. Of course, Lebanon became a theater for, for all the contradictions in the Arab world, social, political, so on and so forth. But on this one level, Lebanon became the theater for the destruction of this movement that was the last stumbling block in the way of the ascendancy, the total ascendancy of the conservative Arab right and the implementation of its policies. Suffice it to say that by 1976, the Palestinians emerged from the conflict in Lebanon, weakened politically and militarily, as attested by the Palestine National Council program adopted in Cairo, the Palestine National Council being the Palestinian parliament in exile. In other words, the Palestinian movement was uh, tamed. The Palestinian movement, having emerged from the conflict in Lebanon with uh, a weakening of its political and tactical resources, in essence, paved the way for the visit of Sadar to Jerusalem. Now, let's keep in mind that despite some of the statements made by uh, Assad about how the visit was not uh, timely, was not good, it was rejected, despite the sort of passive reception of it by Hussein and uh, Khalid and so on. In fact, these leaders in the conservative, this conservative bloc, these leaders welcomed the visit of Sadat to Jerusalem. In fact, they stood there washing their hands with invisible soap, hoping that Sadat will come back with a settlement tuned in to their political vision of what a settlement should be, that is, Resolution 242 and uh, a uh, separate state for the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. But Sadat came back from Jerusalem and came back from uh, Camp David with a settlement that fell even far short of the, what the conservative Arab right could reasonably accept and still remain in power. You see, the Camp David Accords failed to take into consideration one crucial fact about the struggle in the Middle East. And namely, that the struggle for Palestine is not a variable, but a constant of the historical equation in the Middle East. That in fact, Palestinian rights Palestinian national rights could not be reduced to a fragment, as they were indeed in the Camp David Accords, in the form of autonomy, without bringing about the collapse of the whole negotiating process. As in fact did happen, as evidenced by 
the rejection of the accord by all the Arab states, including the very conservative segment of it, and the isolation of Egypt uh, from the rest of the Arab world, and the virtual impossibility of imposing a settlement on the Palestinians, a la Camp David Accords. Now, I'm not going to discuss with you what the Camp David Accords offered the Palestinians. Frankly, if you excuse my idiom, the Camp David Accords are trash in terms of what they offered the Palestinians. We will not dignify the Camp David Accords with an analysis, clause by clause, of what they offered the Palestinians. I mean, look at it this way, for heaven's sake. Here was the case of three men, you know, a former Egyptian army officer, a former uh, Polish immigrant to Palestine, and a former peanut farmer from Georgia, meeting in a distant mountain retreat in Maryland to decide the destiny of the Palestinian people over their heads and over their pleas in the form of autonomy, and then turn around and scream at the Palestinians when they said foul. Scream at them by defining them as being not moderate enough. What is autonomy all about, for heaven's sake? Autonomy, autonomy for the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. What they're talking about here is um, uh, giving autonomy to uh, less than one half the Palestinian people in 21% of their homeland. Autonomy means simply the granting, thanks a lot, the granting of Palestinians of the right to run their post offices and banks and maybe uh, traffic jams in Nablus and Ramallah. With, of course, uh, Israeli occupation continuing um, to terrorize the population and to dictate the destiny of the Palestinians. No Palestinian leader, no Palestinian movement, no influential Palestinian group was ever going to emerge and say, yes, let's talk about it. Even the conservative Arab right itself, whose political, economic, social, and historical uh, links are with the American government, rejected that. How could we expect the Palestinian people to accept as a terminus of their historical rights in a struggle that they have been waging for the last 60 years at heavy cost? of a settlement known as autonomy or self-rule. That is, with a lot of Israeli rule and little Palestinian self involved in the situation. In other words, what they were saying in Camp David, of course, with contempt for the Palestinian people, was essentially that you people do not exist. That's essentially what they were saying. I mean, the Palestinians living outside the West Bank and Gaza were not even mentioned. They were dismissed as the refugee problem. You see, we are refugees. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they were saying was what uh, Golda Meir said in 1971 about the Palestinians. She said in an interview with the Sunday Times, she said, the Palestinians, who are they? They don't exist. She was an old lady. I think she was raising serious doubts about the professional skills of her automatrist when she said that, because we do exist. And we have existed very passionately as a centrality of the conflict in the Middle East for the last 60 years. Rather, the question before us is not what the Camp David Accords are, uh, are about, but what are the consequences of Camp David? What is going to happen in the Middle East? He was the case, of course, we said in terms of Camp David, he was the case of um, the American government trying to uh, get a firm foothold in the region in its attempt to impose the Camp David Accords to protect its massive political and economic interests. He was Israel, of course, uh, trying to continue, perpetuate its occupation of Palestine. And here was Egypt defecting from the Arab world because it had decided, somewhere along the line, to throw its eggs in the American imperialist basket. The question before us is, now, following the Baghdad summit, that is to say, uh, what appears to be the firm rejection of the Camp David Accords by the rest of the Arab world, what are the consequences of this? 
And let's face it, we have to admit it, whether we like it or not, the Camp David Accords are a historical, a major historical juncture in the struggle for Palestine. Camp David Accords are as equally significant as the uh, Balfour Declaration, as the partition of Palestine, and so on. What are the consequences of this major historical event? That sought, that sought to isolate the Palestinians, to ignore uh, the one major pivotal factor in the struggle in the Middle East, the Palestinian problem. What are the consequences of it? What, in fact, is going to happen? Now, history is a dynamic, not a static process of self-transformation. History is not a linear uh, process. History doesn't go from A to B to C. So any attempt on my part to arrogantly give you a scenario of what is going to happen would, in fact, be much too presumptuous on my part, anybody's part. But let us look at a few events in our history and see if we can learn from them. And indeed, scientifically attempt to see a precedent for this. Since we agree that the Camp David Accords, the isolation of Egypt from the Arab world is a major event, Egypt has historically and traditionally been an, a, a major component of the, of the Arab world. All of a sudden, it has defected from the Arab world. There's a vacuum. This is a major historical juncture. Now, let's look at some of the events that have taken place recently. I'm sorry, not recently. Let's say over the last 30 years. Major historical junctures and what they did, what happened in their wake. Look at the cataclysmic events of 1948, that is to say, the establishment of Israel in Palestine and the expulsion of the Palestinian people from it, or the dismemberment of Palestine and the dismemberment of the Palestinian people. This was a major cataclysmic event that uh, was followed by the defeat of the Arab armies in their first confrontation with Israel. I mean, for the establishment of a settler state in the heart of the Arab world, as late in history as 1948, when colonialism was being confronted and defeated on every level all over the third world, was a dramatic event in the Middle East. And the defeat of the Arab armies against this entity in Palestine was a major event. It was a cataclysmic event that created such a vacuum. Major upheavals in Syria and about six or seven coup d'etats in about three or four years. It resulted in upheavals in uh, the social structure of Lebanon and, uh, e and Jordan, which resulted in the dispatch of American Marines to Lebanon in 1958, remember? And to British forces, and British forces to Jordan. It resulted that one event of 1948 sharpened the contradiction so cataclysmically in the Arab world that it transformed. It had to. It was such a major pivotal event it just shook the ancien regime. It shook the, um, the old uh, system in, uh, in the Arab world. It shook it so from its very foundation, it sharpened its contradictions that, of course, it had to dynamically create conditions for its antithesis. And that, in fact, was happened. what happened was the emergence of radical Arab nationalism, confrontationist in its ideology, anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, committed to a notion of Arab unity and, and uh, non-alignment, third world solidarity, and so on. Mind you, the Arab world was not, following 1948, it did not become a revolutionary proletariat uh, structure. It did not. It was um, a juncture in its development. It became a, uh, a radical nationalist entity. Take another event. 56 was, an, was another war. 56, of course, was the tripartite aggression against Egypt by Israel, France, and Britain, on the one hand, fighting against uh, Egypt. This is what was known in those days as the Suez Crisis, or the Suez Debacle. Well, this was not a major war. It was not a major event. It didn't shake the foundation of the Arab world as cataclysmically as did the events of 1948, but it shook it nevertheless. That Arab nationalism became even more confrontationist after 1956. 
take 1970, 1967, the so-called Six Day War, the June War, 1976, a major event. Defeat of the Arab armies of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan against Israel. This was the defeat of these armies in a matter of um, six days, and the discredit uh, the Arab leaders received as a consequence of the uh, pronouncements and draconian threats and so on that were proven to be empty, again sharpened the contradiction. What happened after 1967 was there was such a vacuum in the Arab world that it had to be filled by the antithesis that created it. The vacuum was filled by the emergence of the Palestinian revolutionary movement. Let's face it, this was no mean event. The emergence, I should say the re-emergence of Palestinian nationalism from underground 1967 was a major historic juncture in response to an equally major historic event in that region. 73 worked the other way. 73 was viewed by the Arab masses, deceptively, as a victory for them. You see Sadat and Assad and the rest of these um, idiots were talking, excuse me, uh, the rest of these uh, people were talking about how um, the 1973 war was a major victory. They had deceived the masses into thinking it was a major victory. Sadat was the hero of the crossing. Assad was the hero of the Golan. Now they were talking about having defeated Israel in the 1973 war. They are now talking from a position of strength. Now there are a set of regimes dedicated to the national aspiration of the Arab masses and the Palestinian masses. It created a vacuum for the emergence from underground of the conservative Arab right which was institutionalized, of course, in the nation state structure. Its emergence characterized by this block that I spoke of before, Egypt, or the regime, rather, in Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, of course. I mean, there were other uh, contradictions triggered, you see, by the 73 war. I mean, the increase in the oil, uh, oil prices um, uh, turned or transformed uh, Saudi Arabia all of a sudden into a major um, uh, Arab uh, state with political uh, significance in the region and so on. Suffice it to say, 73 was a major event. It also created conditions for its antithesis. Now, I submit to you that the Camp David Accord, being a historical junction, being a cataclysmic event, is now already creating conditions for a vacuum to occur. In fact, if nothing else, it has created conditions for the disintegration of the conservative Arab right. This block that the American government, as an imperialist power, which is what the American government is all about, it has resulted, therefore, in the disintegration of the conservative Arab right as a power block that was able to assert uh, its uh, reality on the Arab region. Indeed, what had been a conservative Arab uh, regime in the past was now, is now having to respond to these contradictions by becoming radical. We know what happened in the Baghdad summit. King Hussein um, and uh, President, uh, and uh, President Assad. Uh, Sorry, what I said in Arabic, I should explain, translate. I couldn't, I keep blocking uh, uh, President Assad's name for some reason. So I said in Arabic, I said, what is that asshole's name? <laughs> so at any rate, um, what, what in fact happened was that the Arab leaders who in the past had been wanting to get on the bandwagon politically and ideologic, ideologically of the conservative Arab right were now finding themselves willy-nilly driven into the opposite direction of having to seem to their masses as radical and as confrontationist. 
And of course, we know the Baghdad summit. We know the isolation, the acute isolation of Egypt from the Arab world and the rest of it. What is going to happen? I do not know. I just know that we now have a vacuum that will be created and I know that what will emerge will be the dialectical opposite of what had created the vacuum in the first place. I submit to you that what we are going to witness will be the emergence of the radical Arab left in the Arab world. Willy-nilly, the radical Arab left will now emerge. Of course, let's keep in mind also that the events in Iran uh, will have a major significance in reinforcing uh, the um, conditions for the re-emergence or the re-emergence of the radical Arab left. Ladies and gentlemen, now, a lot of people have been talking about Palestinians are moderate or not moderate. Why don't they reject this or accept that? Why don't they accept the Palestinian state? And why do they keep going on these guerrilla raids? And all this is peripheral to the issue. All this is totally divorced from the reality of a creative and meaningful understanding of what is happening in the Middle East. What is happening in the Middle East today in Palestine is that we have the existence of a plus minus dichotomy between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We have the oppressive kinship of the occupier and the occupied, the state and the stateless, the victim and the victimizer, the colonizer and the colonized, the slave and the slave master. There's no way that the Palestinian people can recognize Israel. There's no way that the Palestinian people can legitimize Zionism. I don't care what anybody says. It is a meaningless notion to even talk about the Palestinians recognizing Israel. It's meaningless. Let me explain to you mathematically and logically why it is a totally meaningless question for any Palestinian leader or leadership or people or individual to say, yes, we can possibly recognize Israel. Let me give you three reasons. Political, historical, and territorial. Territorially, if, I, if someone were to come to me and say, hey, will you recognize the state of Israel? I will say, what are you talking about? This is a meaningless question. Are you asking me to recognize Israel with its 1947 borders? Israel with its 1948 borders? Israel with its 1967 borders? Or Israel with the borders envisioned by Menachem Begin to encompass the whole of uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and so on? What are you talking about? Israel is not defined territorially. You see, the territorial component of a state is crucial to its statehood. Once you divorce that component from the state, the state itself remains undefined. So what, do, what are the Palestinians being asked to recognize? The questioner may persist. It's very clever. He would say, well, look, let's assume hypothetically that we are asking you to recognize the state of Israel with its 1967 borders. Will you then? Please, pretty please tell us, recognize the state of Israel with its 1967 borders. I would say, I'm terribly sorry, but the question is still meaningless. It is still meaningless because it is Israel itself that refuses to recognize the borders of 1967. It is the Israeli so-called government that stands committed in front of its population, in parliament, in his political program, in his statements, to not recognizing the borders of 1967. The question is totally meaningless. Politically, it's a more, we have more reason why we cannot recognize the so-called Israel in Palestine, the Israeli entity in Palestine, the illegal regime in Palestine. Politically, what it means is that we are being asked to declare that we do not exist. Politically, this is what Zionism is all about. Zionism says Palestine is a Jewish state. Someone from Miami Beach or New York City 
or the Soviet Union, simply because he or she happens to be of the Jewish faith, can pick up his bags or her bags tomorrow, emigrate to, and settle in Haifa, where I was born. And I cannot even return there. This is what Zionism is all about. In its concrete, everyday reality, this is what Zionism is all about for us. We are being asked to legitimize and recognize a Jewish state in Palestine, in our country. Well, I don't like Palestine to be Jewish. I happen to be a secular person. I mean, I'm a Muslim by birth, and Christian by spirit, and maybe a Jew by lifestyle. But I am a secular person. I just don't want Palestine to be, uh, to be a, a, a Jewish state. I don't want it to be a Muslim state or a Buddhist state. I don't want it to be the uh, uh, sole domain of one people, another people, a people essentially from Europe and Poland and so on, who want to live in Palestine at the cost of negating our own right for statehood. This is just one reason and many others in terms of what Zionism is all about. Zionism wants to express ownership of Palestine, not Jewish ownhood in Palestine, which is perfectly wonderful and perfectly acceptable there. Historically, of course, you cannot accept Israel, recognize it, legitimize it, or have anything to do with it. Historically, there has never been a Jewish majority in Palestine for the last 2,000 years. Palestine is um, the land from which the Palestinian people had come. It is the land from which they had derived their idiom, their metaphor, their ethos, their totality, their traditions, their culture, their literature. This is the land <coughs> which Palestinians use, or from which Palestinians acquire their set of self-definitions. We cannot just pick up and go and give it away. You see, you punish a people beyond the call of their guilt. And you are creating conditions for a major confrontation with this people. But you punish a people with no implication of guilt, and you bring them to the edge of hysteria. You bring them to a clamor to prove to you by any means that their accounts with you and your God, with men and their gods, do not balance. This is what has happened to the Palestinians from generation to generation to generation. Our sense of Palestinianness has not dissipated. Indeed, it has become even more enhanced. We have endowed Palestine, which is now more than just a land, it's a notion, it's a vision, with attributes that transcend the territorial component. There is no way, historically, looking at the historical, uh, historical right of the Palest birthright of the Palestinians in Palestine, and at the same time recognize Israel. We cannot do that. All we are struggling for now, and we shall continue struggling forevermore till eternity and beyond eternity if need be. Please don't think I'm being rhetorical. I am not being rhetorical. This is something that has consumed our consciousness for the last six decades. It has been the basis of all our subconscious formulations. Mine and my sons and his sons and daughters, excuse me. And this is, we are committed to the total liberation of Palestine from Zionist apartheid. There's no two ways about it. We are the Palestinian people. We are going to liberate Palestine from Zionist apartheid. There's no question about it. We want to transform the whole of Palestine into a secular Palestinian democratic state. For all Palestinians, whether they are Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, nobody is asking the Jewish people in Palestine to go anywhere. We are just asking the Jewish people to recognize the fact that they will never have peace or security so long as they continue to deny our humanity and our right for freedom and statehood in our country. And believe me, 
if a Palestinian leader tells you that he will accept a so-called separate state on the West Bank as a terminus for Palestinian rights, he is lying to you or he is being tactical to you. Quote me if you wish. He is lying to you. I cannot understand or believe or conceive in my head any Palestinian leader meaning it when he says we may or can recognize Israel. We are not prepared to recognize Israel ever because by doing that we are negating our own existence. Our struggle, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is well known, well delineated. It is etched in our consciousness. We have grown up with it like we have grown up with our skin, and it is well delineated in our political literature. It is a struggle identical to the struggle in Azania, what is known as South Africa, and in Zimbabwe. There is a settler, colonial people that wishes to create an apartheid of sort against the indigenous population, the indigenous population will struggle against the settler colonial movement because it is negating the indigenous population's right to be free. As simple as that. We are prepared. We have been fighting for the last six decades. We are prepared to continue fighting for the next six. And believe me, if you have been examining the ethos of Palestinians in struggle, you will know that they have not come anywhere near a juncture where they could be said to have become tired or want to give up. On the contrary, every generation seems to bring something with it that makes it even stronger than the one that came before it in its commitment to liberate Palestine. Very simply, ladies and gentlemen, our struggle is for a total, liberated, secular, democratic Palestine for, the both, for both peoples of Palestine, or for the one people of Palestine, Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, Christians, whatever religion they wish to follow, but a Palestinian secular democratic state. Our struggle is a revolutionary struggle. Ours is a revolution till victory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Turkey, and um, the floor now will be open for uh, discussion and questions. Please, uh, no comments. If you have any comments, put it in a form of a question, and the uh, speaker at his discretion will point at you. We'll accept comments. Why not? Okay, the speaker is ready also to accept comments. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Palestinians in exile, page 20. Palestinians in exile. If you, if you have not met Palestinians in exile, you are fortunate. Observe them, observe the pieces they leave behind as they move on to the next place. Observe the words that come out of their mouths. Then avoid Avoid the tension in the space around them. Avoid the transcendence they point out in the banal. Avoid their blessed visions, their incessant talk, their anger, their affections. They cry at issues that have you laughing. Tears of laughter fall down their cheeks when sadness overwhelms you. They dissect the universe like a watermelon looking for the seeds to chew on at night. They sit in shy shops, squinting at passers-by, commenting on their world, dreaming of similar gifts from the gods, cursing, praising the time the chain was undone, the link came loose. They live inside the belly of the wave like a dumb Jonah, waiting for the beast to spit them out, waiting for someone to remove the barbed wire, to play tunes that thud in their ears, to help them look for gaps between each sound, the helpless outcry between dream and nothingness. They write 
They write like lovers from Palestine, agonizing over who is really in exile, they or their homeland. Who left who? Who will come back to the other first? Where will they meet? Above all, they write, what will they say? What will they say when they ultimately meet? Uh, okay, maybe, how about, uh, this is a uh, exile poem, it's called Doing Time Inside the American Dream. Uh, page 13. <laughs> Doing time inside the American dream. I, I do not know anything about the female aspects of the abominable snowman. My commuter train does not leave on time, and I do not celebrate Labor Day in Ocean City. My place is haunted sometimes by the absence and sometimes by the presence of rhyme. And there, in the living room of my comfortable American dream, my intricate silence is burnt in effigy. Hey, sister, plug me in to all your news magazines with articles about leaking faucets, articulating visions for Mrs. Murphy as she sits watching The Price is Right on her television screen, sipping coke and scolding children for playing with their genitals. I say to Mrs. Murphy, I say to her, I, I ate an olive once, alone, and borrowed a pen from a woman who had lived in Talzata and sold falafel along the alleys of downtown Beirut. I will sing you the Star Spangled Banner if I could ever bring myself to learn the tune. I have passed through the Disney land of your suburbia and emerged from it still with good cheer. That's why we are miracle makers, those of us who come from Palestine. On Connecticut Avenue, I stand by the traffic lights and watch Mrs. Murphy. Now, I don't know whether I am watching Mrs. Murphy more than she is watching me. And I say to Mrs. Murphy, I, I have been excluded from all your churches and mosques and temples. It is like a dressy kind of beauty that sometimes I parade on campus. But today, I wander around in a private car with no license plates. I am so far away from nowhere, and that is why I stop at McDonald's to meet my wife, so she could come into my life with a fur coat for her and a pencil sharpener for me. My shirts, my shirts are so yellow from the, from the nuances of Americana. But she enters the silence, the stillness of my dream. It's discipline. And it is against my will to pronounce the crazy fatigue of my exile and let her hands enter the brutalized body of my ruined world. Long Island, Long Island is so long with a lingering voyage on a triangle of freckles and perpetual blossoms of hunger, breathing an innocent hint of crosswords between our laments. Daddy loved me, but I never possessed frenzy enough to celebrate. And to her, coming from my world, I am just a violent blow vanishing into a vanishing point, preceding the beginning. (laughs) 
Oh, uh, this is uh, a short poem called Ruminations at a Press Agency. Ruminations at a Press Agency, page four. I, I, I killed the man. I, I blew up the house. I, I shot the child. Ah, oh, the land is vast. And I have become a voiceless caricature, placeless in the juggler's gallery. I, I have watched men standing around street corners on Connecticut Avenue and the Boulevard Saint-Michel. I said to them that legends had made a pact with my dreams. Somewhere in the lush fields, sweaty lips betrayed them. My son is unforgiving fanning my shadows like remembered questions across the night. And I, I am crazed by sorrow. You don't understand that I too came out naked from my mother's womb. Uh, the last poem is, in fact, ironically enough, about um, Assad and Sadat uh, and uh, uh, Hussein and Khalid. Uh, it's uh, a poem of chaos. It's called, predictably enough, The Tribal Chiefs of Our Whole House. <laughs> uh, this poem will take four and a half minutes. I need your patience. Uh, it's a chaotic poem. The juxtaposition position of images is intentional. Okay, in the ghettos of our capital cities, where the noise of darkness seeps into the body of Arabism, and from there, far back into the mountain sides of our long struggle, beggars are wearing bowler hats left behind by colonial overlords. At dawn, they make plans to travel to Miami Beach on the back of mules, there to die. And at Kennedy Airport, in the VIP lounge, are gathered together our own tribal chiefs of the whole house. The king of Hashem, the sovereign of the peninsula, the president of the heart of Arabism, and the leader of the Nile Delta. They are traveling today on a United Airlines DC-10, terminating in Oblivion City, near the footnote on chapter 60 of our history. On board the plane, the king of Hashem unfastens his seatbelt and walks down the aisles playing his guitar, waving a Hashemite flag and singing a love song about blonde giants <laughs> and sports cars and the strange nightmares of September. Outside the plain, snowflakes hit the dirty streets and vanish. The passengers watch the king who checks his Mickey Mouse watch on his right wrist and proclaims that Palestine is real estate. Its records are kept in the captain's log where his grandfather and great-grandfather kept them. In return for season tickets to the cricket games in London, for a piece of apple pie, a paperback by Harold Robbins, a six pack of stale beer, and a year's subscription to Playboy magazine. The rivers, the rivers of tomorrow are washing the burning hair and burning flesh of a nameless child from Eilul al Aswad. I am the king, he proclaims to the passengers. I had a kingdom pacing its bloody years among corpses of innocent Palestinians, barking orders to the survivors of a crazy holocaust, and speaking a lingo and playing the national fool, and clutching throats, and then, and then, and then, my tale takes so long to tell. The king, 
of Hashem turns to his friend, President Sadat, in first class, who is sucking on an ice cream cone from Baskin Robbins. <laughs> and reading and reading wrapped in a blue ribbon that he had received from Presidents Nixon and Ford and Carter. Don't you see? Don't you see? He pleads with the king. Don't you see? They wish I was here. <laughs> there are tears running down his cheeks and he wipes them with newspaper clippings about the battles of Telzata and Karami. The king quickly unfolds a map of Amman and runs to the cockpit to tell the captain and the passengers that he has a press release. In my kingdom, the pigs are eating the right shit and peasants are cleaning their rooms and my warriors are sharpening their swords. And President Assad is happy because he knows he can blame everything on the Palestinians with the possible exception of heat waves and all the noise from the distant quasars. King Khalid 